we talked about sunglasses. What impact does sunblock have on our health? And that's another one that I really hate. And I, I just, it makes me sad when I see people slobbering sunscreen all over their body. Um, it, sunscreen is toxic. Uh, in fact, it's quite interesting that, the, you know, they think they're protecting themselves from skin cancer, but actually melanoma skin cancer has been going up dramatically over time, exactly in step with the rise in the use of sunscreen. And we're getting higher and higher, you know, as sun protection levels, uh, sunscreens. When I was a kid, you got, you had five, you had eight, you know, eight was already a lot. Now it's 64. I mean, this is the degree of protection you're getting. Very, very strong sunscreens that are blocking the sun and uh, preventing you from getting a tan and uh, preventing you from, from making important things like vitamin D. So I think, um, you know, we have an epidemic in vitamin D deficiency along with this aggressive use of sunscreen. And the uh, cancer is not improving, it's going the wrong direction. So it's like, you know, it's, hello, it's like, why don't we realize that this is not working and stop doing it? Uh, aluminum in the sunscreen in the sunscreen is extremely toxic and actually aluminum uh, suppresses the enzyme in the skin that I believe is essential for making sulfate. So I think it actually disturbs the sulfate system as well. What's the key initiator of all chronic disease? <laughs> Inflammation, I guess, is what I would say. The gut, gut dysbiosis and inflammation are really central to the whole, to all of these diseases. And uh, they're finding more and more diseases that can treat, be traced back to the gut. It's quite interesting stories with, for example, Parkinson's disease. It starts in the gut and get constipation. And then you actually get this um, uh, alpha-synuclein is this protein that gets misfolded in Parkinson's and actually starts in the gut. And then the misfolded alpha-synuclein gets transported to the brain stem and ends up in the, um, in that, you know, uh, in that black body, that, that part of the, the brain stem that's involved with uh, Parkinson's disease. It's quite fascinating, but the autoimmune um, rheumatoid arthritis is traced back to the gut. And of course, autism has a lot of gut, gut connections. And so it's basically gut dysbiosis and then it's inflammation. So many diseases are connected to inflammation. And, um, and I have very uh, interesting stories that I, I'm working out with respect to what inflammation is all about. Um, I'm really starting to feel that I understand it, but it's basically that uh, it's a, uh, when your normal metab metabolism is not working correctly, uh, inflammation is necessary to try to repair, particularly to repair the uh, immune cells that are weak. So the, the uh, innate immune system is broken because of all the toxic exposures. And the inflammation is a process that can heal them. And the macrophages actually convert from what's called an M1 type to an M2 type in response to inflammation. And when they get to M2 type, now they've got more sulfate. And actually the M2 type has more heparin sulfate in its membranes. And that provides that immune cell with the health it needs to be able to fight off disease. So the inflammation is helping to strengthen the immune system at the, at the expense of the organ that's being attacked because then you've got all the pain and discomfort and swelling, the red, all the nastiness that inflammation entails um, is necessary because that's the only way the body knows how to fix those, mit those uh, mitochondria in the macrophages once they've been damaged by all the chemicals. How do we avoid micronutrient deficiencies? <laughs> That's easy. Just eat healthy foods. And, and really, it's crucial to eat whole foods. And I'm realizing more and more that it's not just all the chemicals that are in the processed foods, but it's also the fact that those foods are so unnatural. They basically take, um, take a perfectly fine food source like corn or wheat, and then they, they um, corn and soy in particular, they break them down into individual um, molecules that are almost like chemicals you know, they get the protein and the, and the oil and, the, and then um, they just uh, reassemble those things into what I call pseudo foods. And so a good example is a soy protein bar. If you look at a soy protein bar, look at the ingredient list, it looks like a bunch of chemicals, you know, and anything that looks like a bunch of chemicals has more than four or five ingredients. Don't buy it. They're not good. And, um, and because they, they actually get rid of, there's so many um, amazingly skilled molecules that are produced by plants so I think people talk a lot about a plant-based diet. I do not like a vegan diet. I think you really need to have animal-based uh, foods to be healthy. But I do think that the fresh vegetables uh, and especially the herbs and the spices are all very, very healthy foods and you should eat lots of them. And we, my husband and I always have a big salad every night with all kinds of goodies in it, you know, tomatoes and, um, and uh, well, lettuce, obviously, and then... Um, yeah, tomatoes and avocado and um, uh, cucumber. I mean, all these different um, 
wonderful things to eat that, um, and eating foods raw is also good because you have minimal processing, no processing. If you eat a raw whole food, that's no processing. So you want to aim for as little processing as possible. And you're getting all those complex polyphenols and flavonoids, uh, terpenoids. These are all really interesting molecules that the plants produce that have been shown, in fact, many of them to do things like suppressing coronavirus, you know, susp- suppressing the uh, ability of the virus to get into the cells. So I think it, it's a very good idea to eat a lot of these healthy foods, um, particularly the herbs and spices uh, in the context of COVID-19. What is grounding and how do you do it? Yeah, grounding is wonderful. And it's just basically walking barefoot on the ground. And especially good is if you've got a seashore nearby to walk barefoot on the ground, on the sand, in the water, at the shore. That's really, I think, the best grounding you can get. The water is a very good um, conductor and um, the ground is very grounded in the sand. (laughs) So you're getting a really good ability to get a negative charge from the earth. So the earth is a giant negatively charged ball. And so when you're on the ground, the, the electrons are actually coming into your body and providing you with negative charge. And that's helping to make your, um, the, the um, cells that are in, in circulating the blood, like the red blood cells, uh, it provides them with negative charge, which helps them to stay separated because if the red blood cells, don't, they repel each other with negative charge and that keeps them well separated. Otherwise they glom together and then they can cause problems in the circulation. So um, yeah, it's a way to get, a natural way to get electricity basically uh, supplied in a healthy way to the body um, from uh, electricity supplied from the earth. And of course you can buy these grounding pads. We have one actually in our bed that you can plug it into ground and then you just lay it um, on your bed so that you're grounded when you sleep. And I think that's um, a really good thing to do. How does a teenager fix his gut health and what helps and what hurts? A teenager. Yeah, I missed that one when I was reading, Um, as opposed to other people. (laughs) I don't know. I mean, it's the same way everyone does, just basically eating healthy foods. And and, um, I should say um, fermented foods are really good. uh, And partly that's because of the microbes that they contain, but also vitamin K2, which is naturally found in fermented foods and very, very important for immune health important for COVID-19 as well. K2, vitamin C, which is fruit. So eating uh, fresh uh, fruits. Um, and of course the vegetables that have all these polyphenols and flavonoids, and then eating a seafood. Seafood is extremely healthy. Organic eggs uh, are one of the best foods you can eat. They have a lot of micronutrients, a lot of minerals, a lot of vitamins, and um, other grass-fed beef is another really good food and organic chicken. So I think the meats are great uh, as long as they're organic. Um, the, the meats that you're getting from the CAFO cows, the confined animal feeding operations are probably very toxic. And I, I would not recommend if you, if the only meat you can get is a CAFO cow that don't eat meat, you know, so organic grass fed, all the good stuff. You really try to go for the high end foods and, and, you know, you're spending extra money, but you're getting the quality with that extra money. It's worth it. What's happened when you've reported your research to the media? (laughs) <laughs> well, <laughs> some of the media has been very kind to me, I should say. And of course, that's the alternative media. And I have had a great relationship with Dr. Mercola. And I know he's being blasted by the mainstream, absolutely blasted. And he's fighting back, I think, with extraordinary capability. And I am in great admiration of people like Dr. Mercola, who are able to stand up to these people and continue to carry forth and produce excellent, excellent material day after day. Um, educating the public on what's really going on uh, in the world today. The main, there's just such an enormous gap between what's called mainstream and alternative media. And of course, all this suppression that's going on. Um, whenever you mention vaccines, if you say anything negative about vaccines, you basically are going to be taken off, you know, and it's just incredible the power that they have to, uh, to control us and to, to stop our message from getting through. That's been an incredible frustration for those of us who are, recognizing what's happening in this world and feeling somewhat powerless to fix it. You know, we feel like we have to, we have to get our message across, but we have to do it in such a way that we're constantly fighting the mainstream media in the process, which is really, really unfortunate. So you would say then that academics and and scientists are being censored? Absolutely. Absolutely the case. Yes. I certainly have experienced it firsthand. 
you have a chapter in your book called Alzheimer's disease and the sulfur cycle. Please explain to us more about what that's about. Now, I think that chapter was cholesterol sulfate and the sulfur ch- and the sulfur cycle, but I'm, I'm not sure. But anyway, I had, I did talk about Alzheimer's in the book and I did talk about a lot about the sulfur cycle. And that book was written by the way, in 2012, it was published much later. I wrote that book when my husband was on sabbatical in Taiwan. And this is Cindy and Erica's obsession that you're talking about. This is my only published book so far. Uh, which was a lot of fun. It's a novel. And I folded a lot of my, I was working out my own theories at the time. And so Cindy was sort of my protagonist who was, you know, <laughs> kind of me, you know, she was, she, I identified with this, uh, with the character Cindy in that, in, in that book. And uh, so she was on a journey to try to figure out, which I was on that same journey to try to figure out autism. And, um, and so it's the, um, cholesterol sulfate and the sulfur cycles. The sulfur cycle is just really, really fascinating. And that's what I've been um, deeply in- intrigued by for many, many years. And it really has to do with, a, I, I think it's a cycle between, you know, hydrogen sulfide gas and then um, sulfur containing um, organic molecules like, you know, cysteine, homocysteine, glutathione, for example, contains sulfur. That's a very important antioxidant. So there's all these, um, taurine is another one, all these organic molecules that contain sulfur. There's many others actually. And they're all really important in your metabolism, but then they eventually go back to sulfate. So there's a hydrogen sulfide to organic matter to sulfate cycle and then back to hydrogen sulfide gas. So there's a complete cycle that way. And that, and that whole cycle, sulfur is actually on the same column of the periodic chart as oxygen, it's right below oxygen. And oxygen is obviously essential for life. We all know that. Uh, sulfur is also essential for life and probably equally as oxygen, although we don't realize that. And we don't even have a, um, a minimum daily requirement for sulfur. It's just assumed that we're getting plenty. So it's kind of surprising to me that it hasn't become more visible as a, as a nutrient that we need to make sure we get plenty of. And um, so, yeah, that's a sulfur cycle. And then cholesterol sulfate is, uh, cholesterol sulfate was where I started because that is a really fascinating mo- molecule and it's produced in the skin in response to sunlight along with vitamin D. So the skin, uh, sunlight catalyzes the synthesis of vitamin D, but it also catalyzes the synthesis of cholesterol sulfate, which is then shed by the skin into the circulation. And that cholesterol sulfate, I believe is very, very important for two things, transporting cholesterol and transporting sulfate. And so when cholesterol sulfate is deficient, uh, both cholesterol and sulfate become deficient. And I believe that heart disease is actually a cholesterol sulfate deficiency problem. And so it's a, quite a reversal from the, the current framework of heart disease views it as a, uh, a cholesterol excess problem. But I think that's incorrect. It's really that the heart is actually squirreling away its purpose. It's just like a, a squirrel would save nuts. It's saving cholesterol in the artery walls leading into the heart with a goal of producing cholesterol sulfate should sulfate become available. And the problem is sulfate's not available. And so it has to wait until the sulfate comes and then release the cholesterol sulfate and deliver both the cholesterol and the sulfate to the heart. And both of them are really essential for the heart's function. So when you do something like a statin drug, you're working against, you're gonna end up with heart failure over time because your heart is so deficient in cholesterol, ironically, which is the thing we think is a toxin. So cholesterol is an absolutely essential molecule for human health. And sulfate plays a very important role in in moving it around in the body. So when there's not enough sulfate, you have to put the cholesterol inside these particles, the LDL, the HDL, these LDL particles that are considered to be so bad. You have a high serum LDL, you need to take a statin drug. You have that high LDL because you don't have enough sulfate and you can't transport the cholesterol efficiently with the sulfate version of the molecule.